morning. Hope everybody's doing all right this morning and that you're surviving the heat and, and all of that. Um, so we are in a series called It's Hot Again. Um, this is a second part series to last summer when it was hot, and this summer it's hot again. These sermons have nothing that connects them other than the Bible, so there's no major theme running through them. They're individual sermons that, that we're talking about each week. And um, this one is um, about the fire of love. Fire of love in the Bible. And um, this is what you call a match, right? And um, a, few, a few weeks ago, probably maybe a month ago when it was a little bit cooler, Roger and a few other people started to burn brush out here, um, right out here. I don't know if you noticed that the corner is being, everybody's noticed the corner. You are at least that observant. Okay, great. I got, got some head shakes. Just, just wondering about it. There's some stuff going on. There's still some brush that needs to be burnt. But um, you, what, what would happen is, the first thing uh, somebody in the church would do, Roger, is that he would take some paint that is um, oil-based paint, and he would put it on the wood, Right? And then he'd strike his little match. And then he'd take a piece of paper, right? And he would light the piece of paper. Of course, his match did a lot better than that because it wasn't wind going, you know, behind him. And he'd light this paper and he'd put it on that paint and it would start the fire immediately. Nothing else. He didn't need anything else for it. Just that. Just start the fire. There it went. It burned all day. Pretty neat. But it all started with the little match. Now, how many of you use these at home? These matches. Right? You do? I'm telling you, man, I'm, I'm inept sometimes as, as a guy or whatever. How many of you use them on your grill? Like when you light your grill? Like you start with this little flame and you light your grill with your charcoal, right? There's not many charcoal grill people in here. Well, we can tell you you're not eating good. Um, how many of you do this at the fireplace? Like you have fire in the wintertime at the fireplace. You don't have a fire in the fireplace. It's gas operated. Put your hand down. Boy, put your hand down. No, not in the fireplace. I don't think this is the time to argue with me because I could take you out. Come here, boy. Let me see your shirt. I tell you what, teenagers. Oh, my goodness. Boy, if you want to have a good afternoon, <laughs> you, you better stop right now. <sighs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so some of us do, do like fires in the backyard. Like I've been to the Caudill's house with a fire in the backyard. Um, I've been to, um, I think that's about it. I think you're the only, no, I've been to Ben Miller's house with a fire in the backyard before. I think I've been to anybody else's house with the fire in the back. Your house. No, not your house. You. You had a house. You had a house with the fire in the backyard. You. you. Derek was controlling that fire. But it all starts with a little flame that is connected to something else that then connects with the fire that you're trying to produce, and it produces a big, big fire. A big fire. So, with that said. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the Song of Solomon. Now this morning, for the sermon, we have ambiance. It's going to be a romantic morning. So the flame has started. Some of you have never seen this before. Some of you have. But nonetheless, it's a fire. Now the Song of Solomon is where we are this morning. I do want to let you know that this, if you know the Song of Solomon... Um, we're not going to get into the R-rated aspects of the Song of Solomon. It'll be more G, PG, maybe pushing the PG lemon of it, but nonetheless, that's, that's what we're going to do. So, the Song of Solomon is a book in the Bible that is about love, and it's the love between two people, a man and a woman. And they have fallen in love, and they love each other, and they desire each other, and they want each other, and they're excited about living their life with each other the rest of their lives. So, there's a couple of things in the Song of Solomon that it teaches us about love. First of all, love is mutual. 
Love is mutual. In other words, the man loves the woman as much as the woman loves the man. It's a mutual love and respect. If you notice chapter 1, verse 4, it says this, Draw me after you, let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. It's an us. So it is no surprise that the woman initiates or takes the first step toward love. It's no surprise. We, we often think that maybe the guy should call the girl first, and that's a rule in my house. You, the guy should call the girl first, that sort of deal, sort of deal going on. But it's actually the girl, the lady, that often, more than not, takes the first step toward the guy, right? That's good because guys are chicken. I'm not trying to say anything, but we are a little bit chicken. There, there's a few of us that are really outgoing, and we'll take the first step, and we'll go after the girl. But most of us are kind of like our pride and stuff. Come on, guys, you know what I'm talking about. Our pride is that we don't want it hurt. We, we like her, but we're not really sure we like her. By the way, I'm married. I'm not looking. I'm just... It's the past, right? You, we don't take the first thing because you, you um, it's kind of weird. How many of you have seen Spider-Man Homecoming? Nobody? Some of you? Oh, put your hand down. Uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, right? Well, in that movie, he likes a girl, and she's the one that takes the first step toward him, and he's shocked that she likes him like he likes her. He, he's just shocked. Well, that's generally the way it goes. So it's not surprising that the woman says, draw me after you, speaking to the men, let us run. It's not uncommon. I mean, that, it's not a surprise. Well, the man later in this gives her a compliment and tells her, here's how you can find me. I have some sheep. When the sheep go through the field, they make a path. What I want you to do is I want you to take your goats, because it's all poetic, this is what he's saying to her. I want you to take your goats and your herd of goats, and I want you to follow my sheep path that I've made and meet me at where that stops, and we'll spend some time together. Now, I think that's a wonderful first date, don't you? Just out in a big field, there's some sheep, there's some goats chewing on a piece of grass, talking to your woman. Isn't that romantic? This is just absolutely amazing. That is why this scene, this scene is set up to where that is exactly what they're doing. So all throughout the, book, the Song of Solomon, you have her compared to goats, which that must be an ugly little bit, but she has inner beauty. And he's compared to other, other farm animals, which means that he's not exactly handsome either, but there's an inner beauty there that she sees. So it's not that sort of thing on it. It's kind of weird that animals would be used. I am not going to go home today and say, honey, man, I saw, I saw Aaron Sink's goat, and man, you resemble him. <laughs> I don't know if that conversation would go well at all at this day and age. But nonetheless, they're using animals. So they're mutual. So they, throughout this book, they express love to each other in a mutual way. She says something, then he answers Sometimes he says something and she answers, and it's all positive. It's all compliments. It's all, I love you, I want to be with you, I enjoy spending time with you. So love is mutual. The next thing you're going to find in this book, if you read through it this week, is that love is exclusive. There's only two of them. Now listen, I'm going to pause here and say, I know Solomon had thousands of wives, okay? This is not what this book is about. This book is about a man and a woman loving each other exclusively, intimately, in a physical way. So not only is love mutual, but here love between the two is just between them two only. The intimacy is only between them two. So turn in your Bible to Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 3, and let me read that for you. And it says this, just flip over there. This is what she says. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He grazes among the lilies. It's an exclusive, intimate relationship. Now, this is important. 
Because for some reason, we think that there should be, in our culture, I'm not saying you do, but in our culture, we think there should be freedom in this area. That, that there should be multiple partners and multiple people and multiple things that you're intimate with. God has not designed it that way. God has designed it for us to be intimate with one person and one person only. If you're a man, it's a woman. If you're a woman, it's a man. You're intimate, you come together, you marry, you have children, you go through life together. It's an intimacy that is there. It is not designed to have multiple or to have multiple views of things or anything like that. In fact, we, we in our culture think that that is, that is intimate or sexual freedom, but it's not. Freedom actually comes from a man and a woman being exclusively each other's. And in that, it's, that exclusiveness, the intimate sexual nature of the relationship becomes far more free and far more desirable than you can ever imagine. It, it becomes better than anything you could possibly see on a movie screen, on anything at all. It's so free and it's relaxing and it's just not suppressive. One man, one woman exclusively for each other. It takes a lifetime for that to develop. It takes a lifetime for two people to really get to know each other and that fire to burn and that fire to be together and that warmth of love to develop. So the love in this passage of Scripture is very, very exclusive. The next thing the Song of Solomon, if you read through it, will teach us is that love is total. It's total. Now, I don't know a better word than total. <laughs> Thought all week. I looked up some different words. You know, there's the thoruses. That's the southern way of saying it, right? I know, I know I said it wrong. I know I did. So, southern way, right? But nonetheless, you, you look, and you, it was hard for me to come up, but love is total. So let me tell you what I mean by that. It's not just physical. In other words, love is your heart, mind, soul, your whole being in the relationship. Love is a physical thing, probably about 5% of the time, maybe 10%. The rest of it is going through life together, loving that person with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your being. It is being their soulmate forever. That is what love is. It's not just your body. Notice um, chapter 5, verse 16 of Solomon, Song of Solomon, verse 16. It says this, His mouth is most sweet, and he is all desir together desirable. But notice this phrase. This is my beloved, and this is my what? My friend. This is my friend. So it's more than just all of that. It's a combination that comes together to make real love. Finally, if you read through the song, this isn't the end of the message. Don't get your hopes up. Don't get excited. Um, love is absolutely beautiful. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Um, turn over real quick to chapter 2, verse 10. It says this. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. That is more about his feeling of the beauty of the love that they have than her actual physical features. He is saying that what we have is very special. It's very beautiful. It is awesome. It is incredible. And let's get together. I miss you. My heart yearns for you. I want to be with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to hear the goats doing their thing and the sheep bye, and with you because it's all wonderful when we are all together. It is saying that, that love, love itself is beautiful, beautiful. I'm glad that we have a sheep right over here in, in, in the left-hand side of the, the thing. Now we just need a shepherd for her. Right, Patrick? <laughs> she may have a couple of people that have applied for the position. I don't know. So, that said, I want to give you a couple of words that is used by the Song of Solomon that, that mean love, okay? Fair enough? Everybody good? Great. I didn't wait for your heads to shake either way, all right? 
Some of you, I think, were at the all-nighter. Maybe? Okay, great. Great. You were. Yeah, great. Okay. So, here's the first one. We have some talking today. This is the Hebrew word, and it's pronounced raw, y'all. So say that to your neighbor, raw, y'all. Raw, y'all means friend, but it's more than just friend. It is a love that two friends have for each other, okay? It's a love that two friends have for each other. This can be in just a friendship relationship, a best friend relationship where you, where you love someone and they love you back in that particular manner. There's really no physical thing going on. There's nothing weird going on like that. It's just a love that you have for a brother, a love that you have for a sister, a love that you have for a friend, a love that you like to go out with your friends and do things. It's the love that you have. It's raw, yah. Um, if you look at Song of Solomon chapter 8, I think. Nope. Chapter 4, verse 7. It says this. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. My love. That word love there is actually my friend, my close companion, my acquaintance. So one of the things, the beginning of the match deal here for them to start is, hey, that's my friend. That's my beloved. That's the one I like to hang out with. That's the one I like to be with. That's the one... I like to do things with. So then there's another Hebrew word. Can you all see that in the back? Is that big enough? Do I need to make it bigger? You can see it. Some may need glasses, but some people can see it. Okay, great. I need glasses. If I didn't have contacts, it wouldn't be good. Okay, so here's another one. That's bigger. It's like on the eye chart, the bigger ones on the eye chart, right? Okay. These pointings always get me every time because it's hard to spell anyway. Okay, this is a habal. Say that to your friend, a habal. A habal. This is actually more of a word for love than anything else. This is a love of the will. It, it's not a fleeting love. It's a love that says, I am, going, I am choosing to love this person. So the match like starts with a friendship, and it's a, a, a companion. It's somebody you really want to be with. It's somebody you want to text all the time. It's somebody you want, you want to be on Facebook with all the time. It's somebody you want to FaceTime with. It's someone you want to call on the phone, on the rotary phone, if you're that old, right? I'm looking in probably the wrong direction for that one. I'm not trying to say that, but it's a rotary. It's, it's when you talk on the phone. Like when I was growing up, not really me, but I can just tell this on Nicole. Nicole had phone calls all the time in the house. They had to get her to get off, and then they got call waiting. And she ignored that when she was talking to whoever it was. It, it, it wasn't me that she was talking to on the phone, right? So it's a person, the friendship is somebody you want to talk to, you want to do that. But then somewhere in this, you decide, hey, this is really somebody, this is really somebody that I can, I can like live with the rest of my life. I like them that much. They're kind of different than everybody else. And your will begins to choose. Recently, as you know, I went to Daytona Beach. I don't know if you know this little secret or not. I was talking to some people in the back and I even mentioned it last week. Um, in Florida, it's off season in the summer at the beach. Bizarre. So you can get places to stay. They're absolutely incredible for dirt cheap. It is absolutely amazing. So we, we stayed at this condo, and this condo like had... Uh, marble countertops, had nice tile flooring. Our bedroom was like a king-size bed, and then you went into this area, and there was like a nice sink, really richy, rich type of sink. And then there was a garden tub right here, you know, and then right here was a shower. And, and really, I don't know who thought of this, but they were absolutely brilliant. They may have been Mexican. There was, there was a, a toilet that actually had its own room. So you open the door, so all the smell kind of stays right in there, and you can close the door. You know what I'm saying? Because you go into the bathroom, and you're doing your stuff, and you're trying to shave, and you're like, oh, my goodness, this, this stinks. But in that, in that environment, you close the door. Are you following me? Are, are you with me? It's brilliant, brilliant idea. 
So, so I come out of that, and then the kids' rooms were, the kids' room was really nice, and there was a nice couch and a great view of the, great view of the beach, because it was beachfront, and oh, oh, man, it was, I could live there. Like, if I could take that and put it here and do this job, I would move from my house and move into that little place. We had a little thing that you click, that you, the garage door goes up, and you park up underneath the building. I mean, this was a ritzy, a ritzy little place. I could live there the rest of my life. In fact, about Thursday, a couple ladies in the elevator, and um, I said, man, this is a nice place. Do you know of any of these that are for sale? And the lady said, well, mine is. Well, where's yours at? It's on the top. Like, they, they had a penthouse, two-story penthouse place. She named the price. You can't do that on a pastor's salary. But, um, but it, it, it would have been nice to actually have a place like that to actually live. I could live there the rest of my life. That same sort of feeling, not to cheapen love, but that same sort of feeling is I can live there the rest of my life is when you're with the one that, that you married or that you want to marry, it is I can live with this person the rest of my life. I have a friendship that has started with a match, and now I'm moving into something where with my will, my will of love, I can say, hey, this is the lady. This is the man that I can spend the rest of my life with and hang out with and keep our goats with and our sheep with. Now, as crazy as that sounds, I want you to know something. When you get to this point, it doesn't matter where you live, what you have, what you're doing. You're satisfied because you're with that person that is your soulmate. Are you tracking with me? It doesn't matter if it's at a garbage place. You're still okay because that love you have chosen. This is somebody that I cannot conceive of the thought of life without them. It is a will sort of deal. So it starts with a match, and then it's like a piece of paper that starts to burn, and you make the commitment that this is going to burn forever, so you take the paint that is all based that you know will start the fire, and you put it on the wood so that the, the fire will burn and burn and burn and keep burning. Here's the next one. Once you have that will, somebody you can spend your life with, here's the next word that's used throughout um, Song of Solomon. Oh, I totally spelled that wrong. And I know all of you knew that. Okay. See, this to me, somebody was in the field and they said, you know, we need to put our language down in an alphabet. There's some chickens right here. They just scratch that. Okay, that's going to be D. <laughs> oh, come on. Y you know that looks like chicken. Okay, so Dodd. This is Dodd, and you read it this way, not this way. Although you could read this word this way, both ways, because this is a D, this is a D, this is, this right here is actually the O that makes the O sound. But nonetheless, it's Dodd. Now, Dodd is physical attraction. Dodd is the point where you're like, uh-huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's when the fire really begins to be hot, right? And so it's like you think about this person during the day, and there's a desire, there's an attraction, there is something like, yeah, I really want to spend time with them, but then I really want to spend time with them a little bit later on, you know. And then we'll hang out after that, all that kind of stuff. But this begins to percolate. In this book, this is always third. Always third. You see, our culture has it so wrong. We start with this. Right? We start with that physical, like, I'm attracted, I desire, blah, 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 because, hmm, they look good. Right? And we go for this, we go for this, we go for this. And what that does is that makes us jump into relationships and jump into situations and even sometimes jump into marriages without actually having love. Because once the lust is gone, you don't have anything else to back it up. Are you, are you following me? 
So love in the Song of Solomon and in Scripture starts with the friendship. It's like, man, I, I really want to be with this person. I like hanging out. And really, all my girlfriends, all my guy friends, they're secondary to this one person that I just want to be with. And then it moves to, like, the will a hub. It, it moves to that, the will. Man, I really can't, I'm choosing to love this person, but it's even more than just a choice. It's, I can't visualize life without this person. And then it moves to the appropriate die that has nothing to do with lust, but it has everything to do with attraction and desire. And man, this is it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why there are happy marriages where the, the guy is but ugly. Come on, you look, at the, you look at the lady, I'm speaking as a guy, you're looking at the lady and you're thinking, oh my goodness, she, she is really pretty. And I've had this conversation with Nicole, that she's really pretty. Why did she pick him? Right? You might think that of me. That's okay. I totally get it. The reason, the reason that is though, the reason that is, is because it's based not on this, alone. It's based on a friendship. I want to be with this person the rest of my life. I can't visualize life without it. And it produces something absolutely beautiful that's absolutely attractive, that is absolutely incredible. And it doesn't matter what that person looks like from that point on. Are you, are you tracking? That is what love is. Anything else is a cheap Substitute for it. Cheap substitute. So there it is. So, there's one other word for love. And I would say that this is the fireplace where the love burns. And I'm just going to write this out for you. It's a seed. It's the love of God. It's the love that God has for you. And within all three of these, inside of this, we love each other with all three of those, and the fire burns bright and the fire burns hot, but it's all within this arena of the love of God. Why? Because your relationship with your wife and your relationship with your husband or your relationship with your husband is a picture of God's relationship with his church. The church is his bride, he is the bridegroom. It is a picture of the love of God. The question is, are you really living? Is your fire really burning like it should? Or is something broken? The other question is, are you trying to have love outside of the fireplace of God's love? Where it's contained but it's beautiful, where it's contained, but it's romantic, where it's contained, but it's perfect. You cannot have perfect love outside of God's love. You can't. You can't. I would submit to you today that at some point in time, and maybe outside of time, God looked down and he looked at you and he saw a person of value that he wanted to be with and he wanted to love in a very special way. And so he sent his son on the cross to die for your sins, to pay for those so that you could be with him, so that you could have a relationship with him, so that you could be his bride. It's an amazing, amazing thought that the love that God has for us is really a mirror reflection of the love that we should have for each other. And our love for each other as husband and wife should be the love that exemplifies the love of God the other direction. It is the way that it works in Scripture. If you turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 7. Um, no, that is the wrong verse. Because, yeah, yeah, chapter 8, verse 6. I knew it was wrong. It's verse 6, chapter 8, verse 6. It says this. Oh, I'm in Isaiah. Chapter 8, verse 6. It says this. Set me as a seal upon your heart, a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. It flashes, are flashes of fire, the very flame 
of the Lord. What is that saying? It's saying that love that is true and real is a love that is fueled by the love of God, a fire that is contained by the love of God. And so with that said, we will attempt this. Love's like a hurricane, I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are in are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so he loves us all So, can you still see me? Good. There are some of you here today that are on your second marriages. There's some of you here today that might be on your third. There are also some of you here today that are on your first marriage as well. This is what the Bible would say to you. Make it the best marriage that you can make it. Become friends with that one that you've made commitments to. Choose to be with that person. And if somehow or another it's missing, somehow or another something is missing inside of you, like that companion, that will to be with them, work on that. Work on it. Find what's special. Develop that desire and that will to be with that person. And then go to Dodd. 
to the physical attraction. But make that marriage all that you can make it. Yeah, some of you that are on your second marriages feel bad about the first marriage. It's time to leave that behind. It's time to make the marriage that you have currently the best that you can make it and your commitment to that person the best that it can be. God is for you. He loves you and he wants that to work. For those that are on your first one, stay with it. Keep working on it. Look, there are some times that I'm not so sure that uh, Nicole's the person that I would like to be with. <laughs> okay? There, there are some days you wake up, you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, she wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, but what you need to be reminded of is that that will has to return. You, you have to somehow get back to that will that this is a person I cannot live without, and you work in that direction. You've already made the choice. And the alternatives is just not worth the hassle. It's so much better just to work on it and make it, make it what it needs to be. And the, and the cool thing is, that love is in the fireplace of God's love. That never fall, falls. It never falls. Never falls away. And connected with Jesus Christ as the center of your relationship, you can have a love that is very similar to, if not equal to, the love that is presented in the Song of Solomon. Stick with that person. Do what it takes to continue to have that love for them. The second thing I'd like to say is there's some of you that aren't married. It's not married. Um, and I'm, I'm glad some of you aren't married. Uh, Aurora and Quinn, I'm glad that they're not married yet. Right? As you look for that individual, you need to look for somebody that you can be friends with first. So you can start a relationship, a friendship, and then you really like their companionship, and then it's, it's really kind of strong. And as you develop that friendship, eventually your heart's going to say, hey, this is somebody I can't live without. I really miss them when they're not here. And it grows, and you choose to be with that person. And then you choose to be engaged to that person, and you choose to marry that person. And that's when God comes in, and that physical attraction, it might come in sooner. I mean, you know, it might come in sooner. That's fine. But that is, that is the direction. Never start your relationship with God. Never start your relationship with the physical nature, the physical attraction. Never start it with that. Start it with something more substantial. Because these are the relationships that last. There are days in marriages, ladies and gentlemen, where you don't see each other. I don't know if you have that, but I have that in my house. We have two teenage kids, and that is our main focus right now until they're out of the house. Not that I want them out of the house, but that is our main focus right now. Their life and getting them set up for, for success and there are just some days where I'm at work, Nicole's at work, we're spending time with the kids, kind of balancing all that out, and we don't get to see each other as much as we would like to. But it's only for a season. But even during that time, you have to remind yourself, this is my friend. This is my companion. This is the one I'm going to spend the rest of my life with, and I cannot live without that person. So even though life changes for you and, and things become busier or, or not as busy or whatever, always remind yourself of the one you made the commitment to before Jesus, of your love for them and their love for you, even when you can't seem to get together during the week. You might just have to say, time out. Time out on all this junk. You know, School is great, and all the activities that come with school, that's, that's a good thing. And, and church is great with all that activity that comes with church. But really, right now, I haven't seen my spouse in so long that I just need to take a time out and spend some time with them to keep this love stirring, to keep that fire burning, to keep that going. Are you with me? Some of you this morning just need to make a recommitment to your spouse. Some of you this morning need to quit complaining about them and start complimenting them. Throughout this entire book of the Song of Solomon, never once is there a complaint. It is all a compliment. Why? Because compliments are the all base paint of love. Keeps it burning. 
But complaint is when you take a big old thing of water and you're just dousing it with water. And fires are hard to keep burning when the other person feels like they are not valued by you. Value each other. Finally, there's never been a time where God didn't value and love you. There's never been a time. You might have ticked him off, but he still loved you. His love never falls. It never stops. He never quits loving you. Never has. This morning, you might be sitting here and you're thinking about all this and maybe the concept has hit you that God loves you. Maybe you need to recommit yourself to loving him. You know, God's kind of the same relationship, isn't he? We, we toll with the friendship with him. We start reading his Bible, right? We start learning about him a little bit. We start learning about who he is. It's kind of a friendship sort of thing. And then there's a will. Man, I'm, I don't know how I'm living without this God that I'm learning about in Scripture that has become my friend. Are, are you following me? And and that will's there. And then there's an attraction, not in a sexual way, but there's an attraction. There's a nod that comes where it's like, I need Jesus. And when you go from friend to your will is like, I can't live life without him till I need Jesus, that is when you really worship. Because you realize his value. You realize who he is. And you're just attracted to him. and, And you're like, oh, I cannot fathom life without him, and he is the greatest thing ever, and I just want to give him praise because he enjoys that. Maybe today you're sitting here and you've never begun a relationship with him, but that is exactly what you need to do. I'd be more than happy to talk to you after this, as we sing this last song, about that particular thing. So with all that said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson from the Song of Songs, and We thank you for um, these three types of love that is contained in, in in that book. And I pray, Father, that for each marriage in this room, that this is a message that will strengthen their marriages and strengthen my marriage, and that you will work. And if there are people in the room that have started the wrong way, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'll help change that. Get them on the right road. I pray for each marriage in this room that, Father, you'll make their friendship strong. They'll have an exclusive commitment to each other. And that the love will be mutual between the two. I pray for every marriage in this room that they will get to the place and where they just can't think of life without each other. For those that are already there, I pray, Father, that that will never dissipate, that will never go away. And Father, I pray that that attraction will be there so that it can burn and be strong. Because we know from Scripture that a strong biblical marriage is actually a strong witness of you and your love for us. And we want our marriages to mirror that love. We're amazed at that love. So we ask all these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. The altar is